in a culture not known for displays of passion. In a time when passions ran high, Stevens the butler lived a life of order and tranquility until the arrival of Miss Kenton, the new housekeeper. Well, no gentleman call us loud, of course, but what I do find a major irritation are those persons who are simply going from post to post looking for romance. This woman comes into his life and shakes him about a bit, you know. He was a challenge to her, and she was a gal who liked to challenge. 166, take one. Columbia Pictures presents Academy Award winners Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson in a Mike Nichols, John Kelly Merchant Ivory production, The Remains of the Day. It's really two stories. There's the, there's the modern story, which is Stevens going off on a kind of quest to try to retrieve, if he can, the situation with Miss Kenton in the 50s. In a very small way, I did make my own mistake, but I might still have a chance to set mine right. In fact, I'm on my way to try and do so now. And that's the sort of framework for the whole film. But then there's what he remembers. And what he remembers is um, his life at Darlington Hall in the 30s, prior to the beginning of the Second World War. What happens within this house during the conference could have a considerable repercussions on the whole course that Europe is taking. Extremely important to this house, Miss Kenton. Am I? There is this man to whom she finds herself deeply attracted, whose armor she simply cannot penetrate. What are you talking about? What story is that? Well, she's a very pretty girl. What do you think? Mm. You don't like to have pretty girls on the staff, I've noticed. Might it be that our Mr. Stevens fears distraction? Can it be that our Mr. Stevens is flesh and blood after all and cannot trust himself? Hmm? You know what I'm doing, Miss Kenton. I'm placing my thoughts elsewhere while you chatter away. He is drawn to her. He's very attracted to her, but he doesn't know that he's attracted to her. The Chinaman from the cabinet room is now outside this door. Come and see for yourself. I'm busy at the moment. I shall wait. Outside. She knows she's good. She knows she can match him. And she starts to try and... and get some kind of human reaction from him, actually. One has seen lots of relationships in life in which people really love each other uh, deeply and sincerely, but the only way they can communicate is, with, is through fighting. Look at it. Is that or is it not the wrong Chinaman? Miss Kenton, I'm very busy. And I'm surprised that you have nothing better to do than stand around all day. Mr. Stevens, look at that Chinaman and tell me the truth. Miss Kenton, I would ask you to keep your voice down. What would the other servants think to hear us shouting at the top of our voices about Chinaman? And I would ask you, Mr. Stevens, to turn around and look at the Chinaman. Directed by James Ivory. Produced by Ismail Merchant and adapted for the screen by Ruth Prower Javala. The Remains of the Day is the work of a creative team that has collaborated on over 15 films since 1961, including A Room with a View and Howard's End, which between them garnered 17 Academy Award nominations and received six Oscars. When we were doing Howard's End, you felt there was something, something there, it was something wonderful. I don't think you quite understand. Oh, yes. Indeed, yes. I'm asking you to be my wife. Yes, I know. I know. Are you offended? How could I be? Well, perhaps I should have written first. I... No, no, rather you will receive a letter from me. Thank you. Not at all. And it's you I thank. Um... Should I order the motor run now? That would be most kind. The chemistry between Emma and Anthony was so good in Howard's End. But we had no idea that the next year, 
we'd be doing something together again. Mr. Stevens. Emma, do you think you'll be in this a little pose like that? No, I think. We were like pigs in, you know. She likes to have a laugh. She's got a bawdy sense of humor, which I have too. And we have a lot of fun. The Remains of the Day is based on the Booker Prize winning novel by Kasuo Ishiguro. Ishiguro asked me, he said, what do you know about butlers? I said, I know what you know, what you wrote in the book. So he said, I don't know anything about butlers. <laughs> Part of the fun of writing a book like this for me was to immerse myself in the, in the surfaces of, of a world I was unfamiliar with. History could well be made under this roof over the next few days. You can, each and every one of you, take great pride in the role you will play on this momentous occasion. Polished brass, brilliant silver, mahogany shining like a mirror. That is the welcome we will show these foreign visitors to let them know they are in England, the order and tradition still prevail. I don't know that anyone in a movie has ever asked, what is it like to be a butler? What is it like to be the person in the scene who doesn't speak, who serves, who watches. Stephen, <clears throat> Mr. Spencer would like a word with you. Sir. My good man, I have a question for you. Yes, sir? Do you suppose the debt situation regarding America is a significant factor in the present low levels of trade? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm unable to be of assistance in this matter. You see, gentlemen, our good man here is unable to assist us in these matters. And yet, we still go along with the notion that this nation's decisions be left in the hands of our good man here and a few millions like him. You may as well ask a committee of the Mother's Union to organize a war campaign. Thank you, Stevens. Thank you, my lord. Thank you, sir. A wonderful butler of the kind that Stevens is representing in the film is somewhat a bit, he's a bit like a priest, in complete devotion to something higher than himself. Miss Kenton, there are many things you and I don't understand in this world of today, whereas his lordship understands fully and has studied the larger issues at stake. And he's serving his lord, and his lord in this case was literally a lord, Lord Darlington. Lord Darlington. Lord Darlington. Lord Darlington. Lord Darlington. James Fox, you know, this is the actor we wanted to work in 1965. Ah. Good morning, here. My lord, nice to see you. So, you know, actors whom you've been thinking in 1965, suddenly they are there with you in, in this film. My godson, Cardinal, tells me he's shortly to become engaged to be married. Oh, Dita, I offer my congratulations. You are familiar, I take it, with the facts of life? My lord? Someone has to tell him. In a way, it would be easier for you. Less awkward. I mean, I'd, I find the task rather daunting, I'm afraid. I might get round to it before Reginald's wedding day. <laughs> of course, this goes far beyond the call of duty, Stevens. Why, yeah. I, I shall do my best, my lord. I'd be grateful if you'd even try, Stevens. It'd be an awful lot of my mind. Look here, there's no need to make a song and dance with it. Just convey the basic facts and be done with it. I wanted um, the story of The Remains of the Day to be a universal one. Jim read the book and liked it very much, and we found the rights were not uh, available. Harold Pinter had had taken the rights and was developing a script for Mike Nichols. Mike called on a Saturday uh, in the sort of early spring of 1990 to say that he just read, read a remarkable book. And I called Harold and said, Harold, what are you doing with Remains of the Day? And he said, well, just sitting here waiting for you to call, Mike. So I figured, well, that was it. And I didn't think about it too much after that. And Harold wrote a very good script and he and I began to work on it. But I couldn't work it out with my schedule because I had this other picture I was committed to making. And it began to look as though if I directed Remains, it would be two years away. Then we thought of Merchant and Ivory. And it, it seemed sort of an ideal marriage. Finally, it turned out to be the things that you feel passionately about, they'll come to you. It was the final irony that we were turning Jack Nicholson into a wolf while, while they were sorting the silverware. And there's something 
Missing. What is it? The spoon from the cruet set, sir. Good. I'm served. When Merchant and Ivory came aboard, they asked their longtime collaborator, novelist, and two-time Academy Award-winning screenwriter, Ruth Prower Javala, to write a new script. I think Harold's script was properly frightening and very strong and very funny. Well, it wasn't a Merchant Ivory film. The things that she did that made it an ivory burger, you know, were, um, Remarkable. She's written so many novels and they've been such acclaimed and prize-winning books and short stories and she's, you know, she's worked for the New Yorker magazine since 1958 or something. And that's the sort of great rock on which she stands. You know, she's not down on her knees in front of these writers like Henry James or Ian e. Forster, whoever it is, uh, terrified to change a phrase or uh, invent or get rid of. I was actually surprised at how much of the book she'd got in. I think she captures that um, very subtle comic tone very well. Oh, God, Stevens. Ah, yes, I'm most sorry, sir. Uh, but I do have something to convey to you rather urgently, sir. And if I may be permitted, I'll come straight to the point. Um, perhaps you will have noticed this morning, sir, the ducks and the geese by the pond. Ducks and geese? No, I don't think so, Stevens. Well, perhaps the, the birds and the flowers, then, or the, um, uh, the shrubs uh, and the bees. No, I've not seen any bees. Yes. Well, this is, in fact, not the best time of the year to see them in their full glory, sir. What, the bees? Uh, no, sir. What I'm trying to say, sir, is that with the arrival of spring, we shall see a most remarkable and profound change in all these surroundings, sir. Yeah. People come to realize it, that if you're working in a merchant ivory film, it's going to be something very special, because the script is very good. Well, I know the sort of films that they make. I mean, I've worked with them so long that uh, I, mean, I don't even have to think about it. Oh, is that kind of you to have come to talk to me? Not at all, sir. Um, in fact, I do have uh, one or two words more to convey to you on the topic of, um, well, as you uh, put it most admirably, sir, uh, the glories of nature. Uh, but it will have to wait for another occasion, sir. Thank you. Well, I'll look forward to that then, Stephen. I'm more of a fish man myself. Fish, sir? Yes, I know all about fish, fresh water and salt. <laughs> the privilege of working on material as good as, as theirs, because always this, the script is wonderful. I mean, that's the, the cement that holds the whole thing together. Then you add to that Jim's vision, his visual sense. And then Ismail is just, I mean, he's P.T. Barnum with Indian charm, and he's a great cook. James Ivory, a French-Irish businessman's son from Oregon. Ruth Brower Javala, a German Jew whose family fled to England when she was 12 to escape the Nazis. And Ismail Merchant, a devout Muslim raised in Bombay, may seem an unlikely team, but they can take pride in having the longest running creative collaboration in motion picture history. Well, Jim and I met in 1961, and um, I saw a film of his called The Sword and the Flute, which was about Mughal and Rajput paintings. I had made a documentary about India without even going there, actually. It was just kind of an imaginary thing, which he liked. He was very impressed. I said, this is a, just a, a remarkable film. I said, would you like to come and direct a film in India? And he said, yes, he would like to. But he's never directed a feature film. He'd made documentaries. And I had never made a, uh, a feature film. So I just said, well, I'm a novice as well as you are, so let's uh, join hands together. Uh, that was a long time ago. They bought one of my books, The, the Household, and my fourth book. We went to Delhi from Bombay and uh, called on her and I wrote the screenplay. All of the people who were going to work in the film uh, were willing to take virtually nothing, and uh, somehow we got the money together. We learned by ourselves. Jim had never directed a film, and I'd never written one. We just learned. It was about in, uh, uh, a young couple uh, in India who were very, had very little money and who quarreled a lot. Look, I've got this for you. I don't want. Only just look. Laddus. Laddu? Hmm. Very good ones. Made with pure ghee. I don't want. Just taste. Only once, huh? Ow! Then from there we wrote another screenplay and then some more. <laughs> Thank you.
There's so many things going on, but they're never going on in the words. And on film, it's fantastic because you've got the camera right there who, which will record what you're thinking and will tell the audience what you're really feeling, while at the same time they can enjoy the fact that you're not saying it. Mr Stevens, yes? if you're searching for your dustpan, it is outside on the landing. My dustpan? Your dustpan. You've left it on the landing. I haven't been using a dustpan, miss. Oh, really? Then it must have been somebody else. I don't follow you. My mistake, no doubt. One of many. cornered the market a bit in men who are locked and caged up in themselves. I don't mean Hannibal Lecter, but men who are emotionally caging themselves up. Beneath that, of course, is a whirlpool of kind of sexual and emotional stuff going on, but it's always expressed in terms of dust. If you like, Mrs Stevens, I could bring in some more cuttings for you. Thank you, Miss Kendall. But I regard this room as my private place of work, and I, I prefer to keep distractions to a minimum. Would you call flowers a distraction, then, Mr. Stevens? I appreciate your kindness, Miss Kenton, but uh, I prefer to keep things as they are. Their relationship of just not communicating is obviously something we've all experienced. You know, the, the, the thing of having a conversation with a member of the opposite sex who just doesn't understand what you're saying, you know. Um, like, I would like you to commit to me. Watch my lips. You know, that kind of conversation with... What do you mean, commit? What are you reading? A book. <laughs> it's what sort of book? It's a book, Miss Kenton. Book. Oh. She fascinates me. He is daughter. Are you shy about your book? No. Is it? Is it racy? Racy? Are you reading a racy book? It's like watching two strange birds mating. You know, it's the dance. Would I be shocked? Would it ruin my character? Let me see it. With Hopkins and Emma Thompson's genius for an undisturbed surface and volcanoes erupting, underneath this perfect surface. That was a kind of magic that could only happen with the grace of God. <laughs> Dear, it's not scandalous at all. It's just a sentimental old love story. You have to pray for something like that. You can't make it happen. I think we all have a piece of Stevens in us. It wouldn't be natural to be otherwise. My grandmother was in service. She went into service when she was 12, and, and she was asked, and the butcher's son asked her to marry him, and he wanted to emigrate to Australia. And she always used to say, I wish I'd gone. I wish I'd gone. It's about all of us, really. It's about all of our lives, the mistakes we make, the decisions we make, inner loneliness, dishonesty, self-deception. Stevens. Yes? My friend, the man I'm going to meet tonight, you know him, Mr. Ben. Oh, yes, Mr. Ben, of course, yes. He has asked me to marry him. I am thinking about it. I see. Stevens never actually looks at or examines life or, or, or sees what's there in front of him. Mr. Stevens. Yes, Mr. Am I to take it that after all the years I have been in this house, you have nothing else to say to me? You have my warmest congratulations. 
in a sense, it's a double love story. It's really about his love, the love between the man and the woman, and also between the servant and the master. In my philosophy, Mr. Ben, a man cannot call himself well contented until he has done all he can to be of service to his employer. Of course, this assumes that one's employer is a superior person, not only in rank or wealth, but in moral stature. And Lord Darlington, unfortunately, was a misguided English aristocrat who, like so many, really didn't think that things were going to turn out so badly with Nazi Germany. Herr Schmidt, Herr Heinrich. How do you do? I had a German friend, Karl Heinz Bremen. We fought on opposite sides in the war. We always said when this wretched business is over, we'll sit down and have a drink together, like gentlemen. The Versailles Treaty made a liar of me. They really did believe that they could have, find an accommodation with, with Hitler and with Germany and that the World War II could be averted. Well, ever since that time, I felt it my duty, my job, Stevens, to hold out a helping hand to Germany, give her a fair chance. So you see, Stevens, this conference is crucial. Darlington is someone who unwittingly contributes to evil from the most noble intentions. Permit me to say how impressed I have been with the spirit of goodwill that has prevailed. Goodwill for Germany. And with tears in my eyes, I see that everyone here has recognized our right to be once again a strong nation. <clears throat> Lord Darlington is a classic English gentleman of the old school. Decent and honorable and well-meaning. But, now excuse me, I have to say this. You are, all of you, amateurs. And international affairs should never be run by gentlemen amateurs. It's not that different from what we've seen going on in Yugoslavia over the last year. You know, Nazi Germany would take a step forward and everyone would, would say, oh, you mustn't do that, but they would do nothing about it. You do please realize that his lordship's been the most valuable pawn that the Nazis have in this country over the last few years, it, precisely because he is good and honorable. <laughs> I wish I weren't so drunk, I could make you understand. <sighs> Sir, I do understand. His lordship is working to ensure peace in our time. My job in this film, or the butler's job, is just to serve his master and to accommodate these great dinners and banquets in the house while these German ambassadors come there, and foreign ambassadors. And he remains detached. Anybody who says, I'm just doing my job, has abdicated responsibility. Stevens. Yes, sir. We have some refugee girls on the staff at the moment, I believe. We do, my lord. Two housemates, Elsa and Herma. You'll have to let them go, I'm afraid. My lord, may I say, they work extremely well. They're intelligent, polite, and very clean. There are larger issues at stake. I'm sorry, but there it is. And that's the first time that Stevens is shocked and realized that something is wrong. I'm amazed that you can stand there as if you were discussing orders for the larder. I simply can't believe it. You're saying that Elsa and Irma are to be dismissed because they're Jewish. Stevens takes the rules of service to ridiculous extremes. I mean, to the point where his own heart is just locked away. Locked away and not allowed any say at all in his life and his destiny. It is out of our hands. I'm telling you, Mr. Stevens, if you dismiss my girls tomorrow, it will be wrong, a sin, as any sin ever was one. Your life does tell a story and it does make a point, but you don't know what it is till you get to the end of it. And that the trick of living is to make a series of moral decisions, always keeping that in mind. Mr. Stevens, I warn you. If those girls go, I shall leave this house. Oh, Miss Kenton. Please. Well, it left him with a, a, you know, an ongoing sense of guilt. Darlington. Wasn't there a Lord Darlington involved in all that appeasement business that got us into the war? Sorry, sir, I never knew that, Lord Darlington. He can't change Lord Darlington's politics. He can't change world events. He can't change 
Mr. Hitler rising on the wings over in Europe, there's nothing he can do, and he sensibly and wisely gets on with his life. Bye. But he does pay a price for it because he realizes that he hasn't actually lived. He's avoided pain and therefore he's avoided a lot of happiness. But that's the story of all our lives. If we try to avoid pain, we avoid life. So I must confess that I failed to tell you the truth. I did know Lord Darlington, and I can declare that he was a truly good man, a gentleman through and through, to whom I'm proud to have given my best years of service. I'm interested in this whole process of people sifting over memories, looking back, trying to fit together what happened. But did you share his opinions? Who? Lord Darlington. Well, I was his butler. I was there to serve him, not to agree or disagree. It's very tempting for us to just say, let's leave it to somebody upstairs to make the big decisions. I'll just carry on with, with my own life. I'll try and perfect the little thing that I do. To some extent, that's what Remains of the Day is about, that you have to really sort of have a meeting with yourself at the end of every quarter to see whether you're really backing something that you believe in. And from that point of view, I think it's a remarkably profound piece of work. For me, it's always been a story about every man. What a moving story it is. It seems to sum us all up. <laughs>